Oh, make it loud for Miss Tina Contiana. Yeah, I'm not intimidated at all. <laughs> nope, nope. Yes. Super happy to follow him. Okay. <laughs> all right. I had a plan. It was 1987. I was in the eighth grade and I was getting out. I had already started to look at college brochures and wondered if early decision applied to me. I was living in a small town in Massachusetts where everyone knew my family, my cousins, my neighbors, and me. I saw leaving as a chance to be reborn, to reinvent myself. Up to this point, I awoke every morning with the determination to distinguish myself from my family and my surroundings. My father was a self-employed contractor and my mother was an analyst for a natural gas company. They entered these roles right out of high school and would eventually retire from these same careers. I'm the artist, the awkward, underweight dancer who still hasn't developed any curves and boasts a personal style that is quirky and unconventional. Hardly the most popular girl in middle school. To add to my familial and social isolation, I have a self-righteous sense of liberalism which enjoys a comfortable residence on a soapbox. I was never in the running for prom queen, but I was always running from something. When the appropriate time for college arrived, I did get out. Phase one of my plan was complete. I went to Baltimore, a socially and ethnically diverse area with a crime rate and everything. <laughs> Seated aside of our nation's capital, there was no better place to feel like you were in the thick of it. I enjoyed four years of a small, very small, liberal, very liberal arts education. Although I had managed to change my address, I had not changed the atmosphere around me. Although I craved autonomy and acceptance for my differences, I was keenly aware that when I flapped my wings, someone else anticipated a hurricane. I could go on and on about college, my relationships there, and how it helped me develop my already over-exercised sense of independence. But we'll hold that for another time. I'm writing about my journey that I thought would end somewhere in my early 30s. Now don't read that the wrong way. I assume that with 30 years of experience under my belt, my plan would have come together and my life would be working like the well-oiled machine it should be. I would have found a place, first geographic, a literal place, somewhere that embraced the arts, alternative lifestyles, differing points of view, near or on the coast, etc., etc. Second, a new mental place. I would be in charge. These would be my choices and therefore I would be happy. I would have a career, something I had been nurturing for the last 10 years or so, and that well-tended career would be bearing fruit. It would provide financial stability, enough challenge to be interesting, and I would be climbing the ladder of seniority. People would know me. Now, unless you're reading this while sleeping, you are already way ahead of my point. Nothing has gone according to plan. Where am I now? I'm twice divorced, yes, twice. The first was a Britney Spears wedding, two friends who thought this was what you do, we tried it for five years and then figured out that eating wings and watching football together is fun, but there should be more to this. A lot more. We parted and he's still one of my closest friends. Then I made the genius choice to marry my rebound. After moving back home to Massachusetts from Maryland, I was at a company party and met a charismatic, charming man from Maine. The passion was intense and we did everything with a fire. We got engaged in a month. I moved north into his house. We eloped got pregnant, bought a new house, the SUV, and pretended that we knew what we were doing. All the while, fighting, fighting, fighting. But what did I know? My last relationship had such a steady pace and I rejected it as, boring as a boring living arrangement between two friends. In this relationship, we were always on the verge of killing each other. That must mean you're invested and that this is real, right? Well, a year of counseling and we were moved out as quickly as we were moved in. Oh, I should mention that during our tornado of a relationship, I opened a small business and had a baby. There I was, divorcee, again, single mom and business owner. And I'm living where? Maine, the least diverse place you can imagine, and similar in every way to the hometown I worked so hard to escape. Yes, 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 just like the fairy tale I had always dreamed of. After leaving husband number two, I fumbled through a year of dating and other distractions and met someone new. He was attractive, established, divorced with two children, and he seemed to like me. And at first he seemed to like what I do. But it did not take long before the conflict of personal and professional became a daily presence. Let me explain. There is an air of prestige for entrepreneurs and those around them. 
Anyone who is self-employed knows the sense of pride you get when everyone else is talking about their jobs and you're talking about your business. While the discussion is taking place, your significant other stands a little taller and you both try to be a little self-deprecating to shelter the feelings of the less fortunate. Then you go home. Once you're at home, reality sets in. When you are self-employed, you don't own the business. The business owns you. It's your bank account, it's your email, it leaks onto the kitchen counter, the front seat of your car, your bedroom. It's everywhere and it demands constant attention. It never takes a vacation day, sick day, or holiday, all of which would be unpaid anyway. We would come home and recount the ruse we played on everyone at the party. Poor unsuspecting guests have been led to believe that there was something to envy about our position. When in fact, they were the ones with stability, a paycheck, a plan, and I can only assume the ability to sleep at night. As I chatted away with the man I loved, the man who kept a steady job and pays our bills, I felt the guilt. I knew he was feeling the burden of being the one that has no options, who must work, whether he loves it or not, all while I was afforded the luxury of pursuing my passion, my ideas, my diversion. As our relationship progressed and our lives became more intertwined and codependent, it was obvious that a new relationship, an instant family of five, demanded as much attention as the business. Something had to give. But there was more to it than the growing demands of our blended family. Running the business had removed me so far from the actual service I was delivering that I was no longer loving it. It was time. I had to make a choice, reflect on my life as a total failure, or appreciate the journey and all its complications. I chose to tell myself that for the last 15 years, I had been traveling according to plan. I had been developing transferable, valuable skills that any employer would consider an asset. I was in a relationship with a wonderful partner, I loved being a mom, and I was learning how to be a stepmom. And now, here we are. There are still days when I feel like I'm finding myself all over again, days that urge me to start fresh, could return to college, explore prerequisites for a couple of semesters, and then declare my major. I see myself back at freshman orientation, telling myself that I could be a writer, a broadcaster, an event coordinator. I ask the course catalog aloud, why must I take Russian literature and its effects on the civil rights of 18th century farm animals in order to major in visual arts? I guess I'll just go to my advisor and they'll help me sort this out. But there is no advisor and the days of escaping to a college campus are long gone. It's just me, my right hand man, our three children, my lost sense of self and an unrealized need for accomplishment. I'm writing a new resume, and after all this time, I still feel like it's as contrived as when I wrote the first one when I was 21. As I talk to friends, I listen to many people in the same situation. The kids are finally in school full time or are moving out of the house. Maybe you're newly divorced at 40 or still married, and one of you has lost your job. Where do these mid-30s, early 40s, batch of wandering souls find their advisor? I hope you didn't plan to find an answer in this last sentence. Thank you. Thank you.